Ryan Stone, president of Smart Sky Networks. You had some interesting announcements at the MPI two days ago. Fill us in on what's new. Sure. I appreciate you having me here, uh, Jim. The Smart Sky Networks is a new 4G air-to-ground network. We're going to be uh, taking flight later this year and have nationwide coverage by mid-2017. What's new for us is really the fact that we're figured out how to create a layer cake approach mm -hmm. to spectrum reuse. And as such, we're able to use 60 megahertz of spectrum in our network, which is 20 times the industry standard right now of three megahertz. Mm -hmm. And as such, with a big pipe, you can really get high speeds to and from an airplane. So that, in turn, to your point of what's new, we'll start to see new kinds of innovation and application in the industry. So for us, what is new is we launched our Smart Sky Select program, which is a label to help identify new applications and services that are optimized to run on this new 4G high-speed air-to-ground network. And what we're doing that's maybe a little different than uh, past services is you have high speed to the airplane, from the airplane, and low latency. Mm -hmm. Low latency means you're not sending the signal to outer space and back, so it's real time. So when you combine all of these things for the first time, you enable new applications. And we talked about one uh, that we're uh, working with Panasonic Weather Solutions. They have a 4D Aero app, and the notion is you have TAMDAR weather sensors that are flying, collecting atmospheric data. You combine that with a new EFB application, you run it over a high-speed network, and now you can do 3D live turbulence mapping on your okay. flight route updated real time, that's new. That is just the start of the kind of applications we're hoping to seed with this open source call to the industry. What kind of infrastructure are you having to build to be able to support this system? This has got to be not only a phenomenal investment financially, but technically this has got to be a serious endeavor. It, it is a serious endeavor. It's one that you can't just start on day one and be done day two. We started the company back in 2011, so we have been at it for a while. A lot of the infrastructure on the ground is a reuse of existing cellular towers that are already deployed, and we put our equipment on those towers. So we're not having to build a brand new tower. We just have to go and have mm -hmm. leases with the tower companies and put our equipment on there. So that part makes the rollout a little bit easier. Uh, we've also just recently announced our core provider is a company called Brocade. They have a virtualized evolved packet core. So these are things you couldn't do five, 10 years ago. And now instead of having a core that's a big building and everything is right there, we can actually have multiple cores in multiple locations to create low latency and do things that before you had to do in hardware space, now in software space. So there is a lot of infrastructure, but our telecommunications uh, side guys and our team, they've launched nationwide networks before. This isn't mm -hmm. their first rodeo. So we're well on the path. Who is, who is a typical customer for, for you at this point? Right now, the typical customer would be a business jet user mm -hmm. uh, who wants good connectivity in the airplane like their home or office. So it's someone who's willing to spend a few thousand dollars a month on a service mm -hmm. to subscribe, but who's gonna use a lot of data. <laughs> uh, it might be that they need to do WebExes with their company, Skype calls, uh, they need to edit a big PowerPoint file. You know, nowadays you'll get a six, 10 megabyte file is nothing. That's what happens all the time. And on current networks, you hit send and you just watch the thing spin and you don't know if it's gonna make it. Now you can do that. So it's enabling that productivity for the cabin. And that's the kind of uh, person that's gonna be attracted to what we're doing right now. And then I think later it will start to move down market as people see more applications like 40 Arrow as an example that have utility, so you'd want the system for uses beyond just passenger connectivity. It's now enabling advances in aviation. That's the kind of uh, work we're striving towards. To be able to incorporate this kind of technology on the average airframe, what kind of commitment are we looking for in regards to hardware, software, downtime, and overall install costs? That's a great question. So our hardware MSRP is $93,000, mm -hmm. so about comparable to the other air-to-ground systems that are out there. Uh, it's two blade antennas, a radio. Uh, we do have an open ecosystem for the router, so you can choose the router that you want. Uh, the downtime is similar to an ATG install now, just okay. because it's comparable amounts of equipment. And then the, the uh, monthly subscriptions range from $2,500 a month for a five gigabit plan up to $4,500 a month for a 25 gig plan. 
which mm -hmm. would be in essence 18 cents a megabyte, which gotcha. is really driving the cost per megabyte Indeed. down. Okay. The industry has survived because it's innovated. One of the things that we've noted though, as people are finding more and better ways to utilize their aircraft, it is technologies like this that are allowing the decision makers to validate their decisions to either keep their aircraft or use their aircraft more. What kind of feedback are you getting right now about the importance of this kind of technology on today's airframes? A lot of our partners are telling us that connectivity today has become a go, no go item. It's an AOG issue. If connectivity is not working, the boss doesn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And that's a shift over the last few years where it started out as a nice to have, then it was, well, it'd be really nice if it was better. Now it's becoming, you have to have it and it's got to be what I've got in the office or we're not going to go. So we are seeing that kind of a shift, but then there's also a concern about how do we make this future proof? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as future proof, otherwise it wouldn't be exciting to see what's next. But you do try to make things so that you can expand the capabilities and make your system better without requiring new investment on the part of the aircraft owner. So for instance, we've done things, that's one of the reasons why open architecture on the router. Mm -hmm. That community, there's a lot of developments that continue to happen. Um, you know, the routers that switch between networks. And through, and, throughout a number of communication aspects of various industries. Yeah. It, exactly. So we're enabling that and allowing that. So some of it is the choices we make, rather than having a proprietary system on that side of it, open that up because that's where a lot of the innovation is happening in the cabin okay. and it enables new things. Uh, we also make it so that our ability to scale and make the network better, a lot of that happens on the ground. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't require any change to the aircraft and we can make our network better over time. You know, we've got 20,000 beams that are gonna be across the country tracking each airplane as it goes. Each airplane gets its own beam. If we see that more and more subscribers show up and we've modeled it based on all the flight data, so we think we've got a pretty robust system, but we can just add more sites, more sectors, and then mm -hmm. more beams to pinpoint so there aren't no choke points. Well, let me put you on the spot a little bit. Yes, sir. There are a number of companies competing in this space. Uh, some of them with significant history, some of them not. Uh, all with great ideas and all with interesting approaches to the problems that are in place for the busy exec or, for that matter, the, uh, you know, the 135 operator who wants to make sure that no matter what, his customers are always staying connected. What is it that Smart Sky brings to this mix that isn't otherwise presented? That's a great question, and I think it's the fundamental issue that we started with when we started our company, which is how do you solve the problem of getting more spectrum in the air and make it affordable? And the challenge is, is right now there is four megahertz of spectrum that's licensed in the U.S. for air to ground. And so the challenge is, if you can't figure out how to get affordable mm -hmm. access to more spectrum, that's what powers all of this. And uh, there was a recent auction of terrestrial spectrum mm -hmm. nationwide called AWS-3. And it was 65 megahertz of spectrum nationwide, went for about $45 billion. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that it never could close a business case to dedicate that much spectrum just to one use for aviation. Even though aviation is really important, $45 billion is a lot of money, and how could you design a cost-effective service unless you had 300 million, actually it's more than 300 million subscribed devices. Uh, wireless is at, I think, 120 or 130% penetration. So it's amazing how many wireless devices are on cellular networks. That's why you can't close a business case unless you come up with a recycling technology, and that's what we've done. We have patents on it, we've figured out how to do this, and we think it's something that has applicable, applicability worldwide. And so once we start here in the U.S., our notion is create a harmonized system around the world, and we think that would be a game changer. And if it makes it easy on a regulator, because they don't have to do anything, they just mm -hmm. say, as long as you meet the rules, you're fine, and we don't need a rule change, we don't need a waiver from the FCC, then that is a home run of a business case. But you gotta do it. And we haven't done it yet, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're almost there. So we haven't disrupted anything yet other than introduce some competition and I think provided a little excitement in the industry. But the proof will be in the pudding, and we haven't gotten all the way yet. And hopefully it won't be too much longer before we're there. But Well, in the same vein, 
as competitive as this industry has been, the technology uh, acceleration, if you will, new ideas, new concepts, new hardware, new software, has proceeded at a breathtaking pace. How do you stay not just relevant, much much less competitive for the future? Uh, obviously, you've got the newest, bestest, most as fast as coolest right now, but that's today. And you know out, the, out there, especially when uh, customers are making this kind of investment, what you did for me yesterday means nothing. What are you going to do for me tomorrow? That's a great question, and the short answer is we have an active Skunk Works program. So even though we're working on our rollout and getting that done, we're already working on the next generation and two generations away. And I obviously can't go into exactly what we're working on. Oh, just between, but, just between us. Right, just between <laughs> us. And, <laughs> and then now you know. No. There you go. But we're, it, it's a great question. And our view is you have to eat, be willing to eat your own lunch. Yeah. Uh, I look at the digital camera industry that was started by Kodak, only Kodak didn't want to cannibalize its film sales, so they had their digital camera division, and we all know what happened. Indeed. And it was unfortunate for Kodak, but it was a lesson that our business school professor a long time ago, I'll never forget him saying this to me, he says, you know, strategy is a fit between the business and its environment, and as the environment changes, your strategy has to change. And in business, the great part is, is you don't have to survive. The world can keep going without you. So if you don't figure out how to eat your own lunch, yeah. then it'll get eaten for you. How about the industry overall? We have uh, a community that is ultra competitive and yet somehow finds a way to be ultra supportive. Um, I'm amazed at the amount of cooperation that goes on be, uh, between fierce competitors at times. Is this industry really supportive right now of the newer ventures like your own versus the more established ventures or in some cases legacy technologies that maybe have one foot in the grave in some cases. But uh, how is the general atmosphere for you to compete in when you are balancing between the competitive aspect and the having to work and connect with everybody else? I, I think it has to do with the dynamics of the particular innovation or new thing that you're bringing to the table as a new company and how that fits with what's in the industry. In our case, we are bringing to bear what would be the first competitor in the air-to-ground space. So the fact that there is only one provider right now mm -hmm. means that we were greeted with open arms, but a lot of skepticism, and appropriate skepticism. You don't want to make rash decisions. You want to vet and make sure that things are proper. Uh, but I think it depends, too, on the other, like making routers, for instance. I bet it would be a lot harder to be a new entrant there because there's already a lot of providers. Indeed. Whereas the, the wireless link between the ground and the air, there is one provider. So I think that dynamic plays into it. But even the one provider, I mean, they just launched uh, a 4G product. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great that they're promoting to the industry the value of connectivity. We believe in the same thing. And the notion that uh, there's not room for two players would be ridiculous. I think that it, it's a... If, if anything, you know, there's a lot of talk in the satellite space of maybe there's not room for eight players. Mm -hmm. but So there may be some consolidation, but we do think and believe that the more companies that are promoting connectivity, it's like the conversation we're having a little bit before this, we're out here to seed applications. You know, the vision of our company isn't to be a great comms company, it's to enhance aviation through disruptive communication technologies. Goal one is what we're doing right now, but why do we have Smart Sky Select? Why do we have a Skunk Works program? It's because it's enhancing the industry that we're all about. And you can't do that by yourself. There's too many different ideas that you, you just got to open it up a little bit. And the thing I like about the industry is we can compete, but we can also go out the bar together and I can say hi to my friends at uh, Brand G, mm -hmm. and they can say hi to me, and it's okay. There you go. Well, it's one of the things I do enjoy about this industry is that it doesn't eat its young, and while it is highly competitive, at the same time, I've watched time and time again, cooperation and even cooperative ventures turn into really great success stories for everybody involved. So more power to you in that regard. Uh, before we finish up, give us the crystal ball from here on out for what we can expect from Smart Sky over the coming months. So over the coming months, what you'll see from Smart Sky is a transition from being a little bit more of a secretive company 
the you know, nature of development, you got to sort of keep things under wraps to a little bit more open as we explain, here's how things work, here's a demo ride, here's the network coming out, customers starting to get on board. So I think we're going to go through this transition from a uh, little bit of stealth mode to a full-fledged operating network. And it's going to be a fun time, an exciting time for us. I'm sure that as any new network launch happens, you always learn things that you can't possibly learn until you have hundreds of customers or thousands of customers on the network. So we'll be evolving and growing the system as things happen, but we're excited about it. Well, please keep us up to date. We'd love to get out and visit and see how the system's being deployed and more important, some of the thinking and people behind it, and maybe even get a chance to see it in action. Sure. Ryan Stone, president of Smart Sky Networks. We really appreciate your time. Aero News Network's coverage of the 59th Annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show, live from Orlando, Florida, is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. Sandia introduces the new SAI 340 Quattro TSO'd airspeed, attitude, altitude, and slip. With integral backup battery, safety never looked so good. See it now at www.sandia.aero. The KSN 770 is an affordable, WAS-enabled, integrated MFD with a flexible hybrid user interface from Bendix King. Get your fingers on the 770's perfect blend of touchscreen and hard buttons. Easily control your GPS navigation, navcom, weather, traffic, and terrain in any condition. For more information, go to BendixKing.com.